This morning we're continuing in John's Gospel. I'd like to um, look at verses 10 through 13 this morning, but again want to uh, just uh, read beginning in verse 1 through our text this morning to be reminded of what it is we've seen so far. And I just remind you as we begin this section that we are looking at John's introduction, what we would call the prologue to his gospel where he is introducing to us the great subject of this gospel, which is Jesus Christ. He is painting a picture of who he is. Um, and particularly um, for the reason that his readers would know, would believe, and would trust in him uh, as their savior in order that they might be saved. But let me read beginning in verse one. Again, John writes this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now I've already mentioned that John has been introducing us to the great subject of his gospel, which is Jesus. He's pointing out to us that Jesus is the Christ, which means that he is the one that God has anointed and sent into the world to save us. And we don't want to take that for granted because if he hadn't done this, there would be no salvation. But he's also pointing out to us that he is the Son of God, that he is God in our nature. Really, God is the only one who can save us. He's the only one who can offer to God a sufficient sacrifice to pay for our sins. It's important that this one who would do this work of salvation, be God. Well, John is telling us that that is, in fact, the case. Now, again, John's purpose in telling all, all, this, uh, all these things is really quite simple. So that you might believe, and that believing you might trust him, receive his life, eternal life, eternal joy, eternal peace, and escape the punishment that you are facing for your sins. Remember, we all come into this world guilty and sinful. We all would have suffered in hell forever if God had not done what we were reading about this morning. Now again, like the Lord's table, we can take this for granted, but we should never take it for granted. And if you ever had to suffer hell, you would know just how precious this is. But thank God, you're not going to have to do this. Now, so many, again, look at Christianity as a threat to their happiness. You know, there's so many don'ts that you can't do, so many things of the world that you really can't indulge in. But you realize that Christianity, so far from being a killjoy to your happiness, really is the, the true path to happiness, isn't it? Because the Lord is showing you here how to avoid a great deal of pain that would go on forever and ever, and even the pain that you would have to suffer in this life is the consequences for the things you do that are contrary to his will because, again, everything he tells us not to do is not only harmful to us but harmful to others. But he is showing you how to achieve true happiness. Now, in his introduction, John now shifts for a moment to this, uh, from his main topic, which is really to introduce to us Jesus Christ and who he is, to pursue briefly his secondary topic, and that is that man is universally unwilling to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. 
so that God has to get involved if one is to be saved. Now again, his goal is that we might come to know Jesus Christ, but he wants to remind us um, as well that man has a problem and that man is unable actually even to receive this gift that he is giving to us of the Lord Jesus Christ unless God himself gets involved. So I want you to see how these two things go hand in hand. Now in our text, John is, is of course given to us a very high view of Jesus, that he is eternal that he is the creator, that he is God, that he is the one who has life in himself. He is the reason for his own existence, but he is also the one who gives life and light to everyone who comes into the world. But John, as he thinks about that, is is reminded that when this one who has done so much, the one who gives life and the one who gives light to his creatures came into this world, His creatures, his people, rejected him. The world did not know him. Even his own did not receive him. But he reminds us at the same time that there were those who did by God's grace. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is consider a couple of different things that John gives us in our text this morning. Uh, The first one is to remind us that apart from God's grace... No one wants anything to do with Jesus Christ, and everyone would have perished. But the second thing we want to see is that God is working in the hearts of some to bring them to himself. The vast majority of the human race and even his own people rejected him, but there were those who received him, and we want to understand why it is that they did. Now, first of all, let's consider that apart from God's grace, no one wants anything to do with Jesus Christ. When he came into the world, John says the world in general rejected him. He writes in verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. In other words, they refused him. Now, as I looked at at, uh, commentators, they're a little bit torn here on exactly what John is referring to when he says that he was in the world because this is talking about past tense. So I thought, well, we might take a look at, at what this could feasibly mean. We need to realize Jesus was in the world actually a long time before he became incarnate, before he became a man. Uh, We've already seen that as the creator, he was here on the day of man's creation. Uh, Moses writes in Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, was that Jesus? Was that the Son of God who was actually involved in this creation? Well, yes, it was, because remember John already told us in John 1, verses 3 and 4, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus created all things. Jesus gives life to all things. Jesus gives light, gives the ability to reason, as well as, of course, natural revelation to all men. Now, in the act of creating man, God was very intimately involved. Jesus, the Son of God, was actually in the world creating mankind. Jesus also made several appearances in Israel's history. Every time we see the angel of the Lord, it's referring to Jesus Christ. Every time we see some sort of visible representation of God, it's referring to the Son of God. That is the one who was there. Plus the fact, of course, that as the Son of God, as God himself, he is everywhere at once. He has been present in the world since its creation. And we've also already seen that he has been revealing himself through the creation from the very beginning. He is the one who gives life and he is the one who gives light. Well, even in in that regard, he was in the world and the world did not know him. It's not that they weren't aware of his existence. Remember, Paul tells us that the revelation that the Lord gives in nature actually does get through in Romans 1.20. 
and this is speaking again about the Son of God as well as the, the other two persons of the Godhead. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. It's not that the world did not know that he exists. It's just that seeing him, they refused to acknowledge him. They refused to recognize him. They refused to receive him. Paul tells us in Romans 1.18 that knowing God, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The revelation of Jesus Christ is unwelcome to the world. Now personally, I believe that John here is referring more specifically to the incarnation. When the Son of God became a man and walked the earth, the one who had made everything, the one who had given life to all things, the one who had basically given men minds and revealed himself to them through the creation in a way they could see. They still did not know him. They still refused him. They still would not acknowledge him. Now John tells us that what was true of the world in general was also true with regard to his own people, his own covenant people. In verse 11, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. You know, that was universally true, I mean, uh, except for the disciples who, whom the Lord Jesus called. But even, even his own people, even, even those with whom he, well, his own family, on occasion, had their doubts regarding who he was. We read in Mark 3, verses 20 and 21, And he came home, and the crowd gathered uh, again, to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. I mean, those in his own family, on one occasion his brothers were chiding him, and we'll see that in John chapter 7. Uh, you go up to this feast, Jesus, and show everybody who you are. And they were just basically mocking him because they did not believe in him. And we have to admit, if you grew up with him, you know, it, it might be difficult to accept him as being supernatural, as being God in human flesh. I mean, he's been your brother uh, your entire life. But even Joseph, when, when he was alive, and Mary, they still had some questions regarding him. What was true of his family was certainly true of the leaders of Israel. Even though Jesus did everything that they knew Messiah was going to do when he came into the world, even though he clearly showed himself to be the Messiah by his power and authority over Satan's kingdom in, in his advancing the kingdom of heaven, not only did they refuse to believe in him, but they actually accused him of being in league with the devil himself. Again, very familiar passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And even those who were amazed at what he was doing, even those great crowds that gathered around to hear him, at the end of his ministry, when just after they had heralded his entry into Jerusalem, when they had the opportunity to, re to have him released, they called out for Barabbas instead and demanded his crucifixion in chapter 27 of Matthew, verses 21 through 22. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. So again, the God of Israel became a man, the covenant God of Israel, and he came to his own people. And his own people not only didn't receive him, but they demonized him. They considered him a criminal and handed him over to death. Now really, when we think about what it is they did, we... we being Christians and perhaps not understanding some of the mechanics that go on behind the scenes of our conversion to Christ, we might wonder why it was that they had such hard hearts. 
Why were they so opposed to Jesus Christ when we see him as something so desirable and something so beautiful and one to be received? Well, it's because of the problem that they had, the same problem that you and I had when we came into the world, and that is their hearts were evil. John's, or Jesus is going to say later in John's Gospel in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now again, I know the tendency to read this passage is to say, well, yeah, there are bad people in the world, but I wasn't really one of those bad people. And when Jesus was offered to me, I received him. I wouldn't have been like these other people. I wouldn't have rejected Jesus Christ. But you do need to understand what the Lord says about you, about me, about mankind in general as we come into the world. The spiritual condition of everyone coming into the world. You have to understand this if you're going to make sense of what it is that John is saying. And if you are really to know how much you owe God. So just briefly, let me recap. Like David, as he expresses in Psalm 51.5, you were born in sin in this world. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and, and in sin my mother conceived me. Why is David even bringing this up? Well, he's lamenting the fact that he's committed adultery and that he has just had a man murdered in order to cover up that adultery. So he is guilty of adultery and murder. And as he thinks about it, he realizes that, well, this was his condition coming into the world and but by the grace of God, that is the way he would continue. Now the reason why David was born into that condition and the reason why you and I were born into that condition is because of a choice that the first man made so many years ago as our representative in the garden when he was put on probation and given simply one command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That one decision to disobey God plunged the whole human race into sin. Romans 5 verses 18 through 19, Paul reflects on it. He says this, and again he's, he's talking about two representatives here. He's talking about Adam, our first representative and Christ our second if we are trusting him but I want you to notice what he says about the decision regarding the, or the first what the consequences were of his decision he says so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men for as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. What Paul is saying is that everyone who is an Adam partakes of Adam's first sin. He is guilty of that transgression and so comes into the world basically as a sinner, somebody who desires only evil. But those who are in Christ, everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, are righteous because of what Jesus Christ has done. So Adam sinned and plunged us all into judgment, into misery, into sin. But Jesus Christ obeys and all who trust him uh, partake of the blessings and the benefits of that work. But you see, it was because of this choice that Adam made that you came into the world in the condition that you were conceived and born in sin and so hating God. We want to understand why he came to the world. The world did not know him. Why he came to his own and his own didn't receive him. This is it. And again, it's talking about the entirety of the human race in Romans 8, verses 6 through 7. For the mind set on the flesh is death, and that refers to everyone coming into the world. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. We come into this world not in the spirit, but we come into the world in the flesh. And this describes our condition. And because of that, Paul says in Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, you cannot do anything good 
you cannot really even seek after God. What he says here is true, what was true of you and I before we came to Christ and is universally true of the entire human race. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. It's no wonder that Paul, as he draws all of this to a conclusion, Romans 8 verse 8 says this, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now I think you would agree with me that receiving Jesus Christ, trusting in Him as Lord and Savior, even submitting to Him and doing what it is He calls you to do, even in the command of the gospel, would be a good thing, would be pleasing to God. But Paul tells us, no, you cannot please God if you are in the flesh. The flesh is what we are when we come into the world. And we cannot, as long as that's all we have, we cannot do anything that is pleasing to Him. And that's why, apart from His grace, you would never have come to Him. Jesus tells us in John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. And again in John 3, verses 19 through 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now again, that's the reason why the world refused him, why his own would not receive him, and why you would not either, unless God had granted you grace. Well, that's the bad news. But again, it brings us to the second point, which is the good news. That God is, or He was in those days, and He is today working in the hearts of some to bring them to Himself. Now, I'd like to say everyone, but it isn't the case, because if it were the case, everyone would come to Him. It isn't the case, but He is working in the hearts of some. John writes in verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 1, But as many as received Him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, on first glance, you might be tempted to think they were born of God after they believed in him. But that's not what John means, and we're going to see that in a moment. His entire gospel is shot through with the fact that God is the one who initiates by his Holy Spirit in order to quicken us to life, as we already saw in Ephesians chapter 2, before we will ever trust in Him. Now John says, in spite of what we've just seen, the world didn't know Him, His own didn't receive Him, that some did receive Him, but the question is, having, you know, understanding what the nature of man is, understanding what man's heart is like, how could any receive Him? Now we've already seen it wasn't through the light of nature, Okay, it wasn't because Jesus is revealing himself through the creation. It does tell you that God exists, but it doesn't give you a love for God. It wasn't through conscience. Remember we saw the conscience is the way that God reveals his standard to us. I mean, what it is that's right and wrong. Conscience can convict you. Conscience can condemn you. It can point you in the right direction, but conscience can't change your heart. John tells us here that it wasn't because they were related to Abraham. He says it wasn't because of, of blood or their bloodlines or lineage. John writes, who were born not of blood. Many of the Jews of his day, as well as today, believe that they are God's people by birth because they are physically related to Abraham. Uh, John tells us that isn't enough for you to receive Jesus Christ. He goes on to say it wasn't because of their choice. He says, um, again, in, in that, uh, well, see, I forget the particular verse. He says, who were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. I've already shown you that Paul told us in Romans 8, verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, apart from God's grace, we would always choose against him. 
And it wasn't through God's old covenant that he had made with his people. Uh, the book of Hebrews reminds us of that very thing, that really the whole purpose of the Mosaic covenant was to point them to Christ. It wasn't actually meant to give them the power to keep it. The law written on stone couldn't change their hearts. It too could only convict them and condemn them and point them to the one who actually could save them. So all of these things can't save you. Why is it that there were some who received him? Well, the only reason why any received him was because, John says, they were born of God. Again, John 1, verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now again, what does John mean by this, that they were born of God? Well, he's going to expand on this a little bit more in chapter 3 in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, but what he's referring to here is the new birth, being born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And remember, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But those, that which is born of the Spirit, is Spirit. You must be born again. Now the reason why God makes a new covenant in the first place, why he makes a new covenant for, through his Son, is to provide this change, to provide this difference, to give you the ability to do what you could not do, to raise you to life. That's actually what he was referring to in Ezekiel 36 that I read for our meditation and what he was referring to in the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah that is quoted by the author to the Hebrews. Now with everything we've just seen about the impossibility of, of your heart being changed by the old covenant and by these other things that God gives, let's read Hebrews 8 verses 7 through 12. The author to the Hebrews writes this, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, I want you to notice the fault is with them. It's not with the covenant, but with them. Problem is, they had stony hearts. He says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. You see, in the New Covenant, God actually makes provision for a change of heart. The reason why Jesus Christ comes into the world is so that he might actually bring about a way for the Spirit's return. The Spirit is the one who actually changes your heart, who raises you to life by putting God's law in your mind and by writing it on your heart. He gives you a love for the Lord and for everything that has to do with him. And it's that love alone that makes you turn from your sins to Jesus Christ. That's why there were any who received him, any who believed in him, and it's the only reason why any of you here this morning who are doing the same actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. By nature we can't do it. God has to provide a way if any are to be saved, and that's the reason why he has provided what he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I mentioned before 
that it's not, the author to the Hebrews is not saying, and neither is the Lord telling us, that there was nobody saved in the Old Covenant, but rather that those who trusted in the Messiah who was coming were actually receiving the blessings of the New Covenant. Uh, long before Jesus actually came in, the merits or the blessings of his work actually worked backwards, even all the way to the, the fall of Adam and Eve. I believe that the Lord actually saved Adam and Eve because they saw through God's promise the seed of the woman. They saw through the animal sacrifices, the sacrifice that God would make. God put enmity between the woman and the serpent when she had sided with him by disobeying God. He actually brought her back to himself and put enmity between the two of them, which means that she was again on the Lord's side. God was applying the merits of Christ all the way through the Old Testament, even up to the time, of course, of Jesus' work. And since that time, the only way anyone has ever been saved is through the work of Jesus Christ. And one other thing I should just draw your attention to is that Many today in what's called the dispensational camp will read this passage and say that this has only to do with Israel. God makes his covenants only with Israel. This is a covenant God is going to make with Israel in the future when he turns to them again and he saves them. But I want you to realize that Paul tells us quite plainly in Romans chapter 6 that there were those who received what God had promised and they were certainly Jews to begin with and that all the Gentiles who have ever been saved are, are being brought into this covenant that God has made with, with Israel. And they are fellow partakers of the blessings of God's household. They're no longer strangers to the covenants. They're no longer aliens, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. But they are fellow citizens with the saints. They are those branches that were grafted into the natural olive tree when the natural branches had broken off, the Jews were broken off for their unbelief. But the wild olive branches were grafted into that tree contrary to nature. That is God bringing the Gentiles in to enjoy the blessings of the covenant that God made with Israel. This is talking about what we are experiencing right now. But I want you to see how that blessing comes about. It doesn't come about because you had the power within yourself to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes about because God made provision for the Spirit of God to take the law of God, put it in your mind, and write it on your heart. That's what it means to be born again, what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. And that's what John is referring to here when he says they received him and they believed him. They weren't born of blood. They weren't born of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but they were born of God. You must be born of God if you are to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one last thing I want you to notice here is this. John says that those who did trust in Jesus actually entered into a new relationship with God that they didn't have before. And you have as well if you have trusted Him. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, he says this, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's the same thing that John is referring to when he says in John 1, 12, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. When you trust in Jesus by God's grace, God adopts you into his family. And being in his family, you become his heirs. In other words, you have a title to heaven. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 16 through 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. If you have received Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and Savior, you are heirs of the kingdom, you will inherit heaven. So what have we seen? The creator of the world came into the world, the world didn't know him, he came to his own and his own didn't receive him because of the darkness of their hearts brought about by the fall of man. But there were those who did receive him. And they received him not because they decided to, not because they were in the line of Abraham, not because of anything that the Lord has given through conscience or nature, but it was because they were born of God through the gospel. God made the gospel powerful to save them 
when it was proclaimed to them. Now, in closing, I just simply want to apply this to you in this way by asking you whether or not you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you have, you need to understand how it is you actually did this. You know, the light of nature may have shown you that God existed and conscience may have pointed you in the right direction, but they didn't save you. And you weren't saved if you, just because your parents may have been Christians. Now, we do know that God does often save the children of Christian parents. He does this because of his mercies, but it's not because you're related to them that he saved you. It wasn't because you chose him. It's not because you wanted him, because you didn't want him. When you came into the world, you were basically just flesh. And Paul has told us in Romans 8, 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. That was your condition when you came into the world. The only reason why, if you've received Jesus Christ this morning, that you did is because God has had mercy on you. He has caused you to be born again by His Spirit. And the reason I bring that up is, again, the reason why Top Lady had some difficulty with Wesley. We don't want to rob God of His glory. You don't want to take away anything. I know you don't. If you love God, you want to give Him all the credit that is His for what He has done. You don't want to pat yourself on the back. And, and sometimes we could tend to do that if we think that Somehow I saw my need for Christ. Somehow I had more intelligence than others. Uh, you know, I made a good choice where others didn't, and I can say, well, you know, it was a good thing I did that. But the fact is, you wouldn't have done that apart from God's grace. You need to give credit where credit is due and give him all the glory for that. If you know Jesus Christ, you know him because of his infinite love towards you, because of his mercies toward you. Remember what we sang at the beginning, a debtor to mercy alone. That is what you and I are if we are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. But now on the other hand, if you haven't trusted him, I hope this helps you to understand why you are reluctant to do so. The Lord, I believe, wants you to see two things from this passage this morning. First of all, that you don't receive Jesus Christ, you don't want Jesus because your hearts are hard. But the most important thing you need to see is this, that he is the only one who can actually change your heart by his Holy Spirit and bring you to himself. Now John is going to tell us a little bit later as he records these words of Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 44. Listen to what he says here. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Now there's a, there's a couple of interesting things that you need to see about this text. There was even a whole group of people that were following Jesus that left him because of the things he was saying. And what he said as they were leaving, didn't I tell you that no one can come to me unless the Father draws them? Well, that, that doesn't sound like what we would normally say to somebody like that, or at least what the vast majority of Christians would say. We'd say, come back, God loves you, he has a wonderful plan for your life. No, Jesus said, the reason why you're leaving is because the Father is not drawing you. That word draw there actually refers to more than just sort of like a winsome, you know, drawing or compelling like you might be compelled if you smell something good in the kitchen that's for dinner and you, you know, it smells good I, and you feel like you're being drawn to that meal because, you know, you're looking forward to how good that food's going to taste. That's not what it's talking about here. The word is used in the context of throwing a bucket down into a well and drawing that water out of the well, compelling that water to come out by force, as it were, overcoming the forces of nature to make it come up to you. It's talking about the Father actually compelling you to come. But as we've seen, putting it together with what we've seen before, the way he does it is not by dragging you against your will, but it's by changing your will, by changing your heart, by putting his laws in your mind and writing them on your hearts, by giving you his Holy Spirit so that you want to come. But the second point is this, you cannot come to Jesus Christ unless the Father does this. Notice he doesn't say this, no one may come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's not a matter of permission. 
The Lord has already commanded you to repent and believe. There's no permission needed. It's a command. He says no one can come to me, which means you don't have that ability unless the Father gives that ability to you by his Holy Spirit. So if your heart is hard, which is shown by the fact that you're not loving him, you're not professing him, you're not serving him, you're not doing his will, you're not following after him, you're not giving your life to him and devoting yourself to him as a living sacrifice, which is what Paul says you must do if you're a believer. If that's true of you, you need to realize it's because of the hardness of your heart and that's something you can't overcome. Only Jesus can overcome it. Only God can grant to you the Holy Spirit to overcome that. And so if you don't know Jesus this morning, then come to him in prayer and ask him for his mercy. Ask him to take away the stubbornness of your heart and give you a willing heart. Ask him to break up that heart of stone and to give you a heart of flesh. Ask him to grant you grace and mercy. Again, grace is not something you can demand. It's something that is freely given as a gift. You need to ask God in his mercy to grant you this gift that you might turn from your sins and trust in his son, remembering that that's the only way that you can escape judgment and have the hope of inheriting heaven. May the Lord grant you then this mercy if that is the condition that you are in. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take this and apply it to us as we need to hear it this morning.